Thank you, Jakey, and good morning, everyone. Let me first start with uh, really thank, uh, th I want to thank the American Philosophical Society for this kind invitation, and all of you today for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. So what we are speaking today um, about microbes. Microbes are just everywhere. Scientists have been able to identify microbes in the clouds, up to 30 miles above the Earth's crust, miles beneath the Earth's surface, and in the darkest oceans. They can survive at extremely high temperature and encased in ice. Microbes can live in a dormant state for millions of years, in the harshest of environments. Microbes are some of the most adaptable organisms of all, and reproduce very quickly. This is why we are thinking of colonizing other planets, starting with forms of microbial life, and why the first alien form to be discovered here will probably be microbial. Microbes are also part of our identity as human beings. From about 50 to 90 percent of our cells are not of human origin, but of microbial origin. The composition and activity of microbes are central aspects of processes that affect our health, such as metabolism, immune and endocrine system function, and they even affect our mood and personality. And things such as diet, childbirth methods, antibiotics, and way of interacting with other humans and the environment shape and alter our microbes, just that just as they contribute to con configure, configuring us and our health. Therefore, really, this microbiome science, this science of the microbes living with us, within us, and around us, uh, reconfigure health, not simply, not because it's not just, health is not just a property of a single body or a single organ, but is reconfiguring as a property emerging from a network of interconnection between our bo body and the environment in which we live. And this has also inspired and gave new strength to what is called One Health or Planetary Health, that is a scientific paradigm that postulates that the health of human is interdependent with the health of animal plants, the elements of the planet in which we live. So microbes make social science and life science to meet because the environment in which we live, and by environment, I, I mean the from the environment of the cells, to the environment that surrounds us, right? So the environment is always and already biosocial. So it's made of biological concrete features, but also of sociopolitical and cultural ones, like habits, understanding, knowledges, policies, and so on. In a biosocial understanding of the environment, the two terms, bios, and social are indivisible. To use Hannah Landecker's words, and Hannah Landecker is an historian and sociologist of science, there is not simply a history of biology, but also a biology of history. That means that the historical, cultural, and political features of any given society leave a biological mark. Landecker gives the example of antibiotic resistance that happens when bacteria can be killed, 
cannot, sorry, cannot be killed anymore by antibiotics. Antibiotic degrading capacities of some molecules are naturally present in the environment, yet they never existed, existed in nature in concentrations seen after 1950. Penicillin, named by Alexander Fleming in 1928, was developed as a drug in England during the First World War. Antibiotics were obtained by farming microbes and synth synthetically producing their metabolites. They have allowed humans to cure diseases and dramatically decrease mortality. Today, millions of tons of antibiotics are produced and consumed around the world. Not just by humans, antibiotics are used in farms to, to promote growth in animals. And they also feed a thriving market in feed supplements, which assure that animals have a faster growth, less disease, and earlier marketability. Antibiotics have embodied human's dream of control over nature and disease. And they are the outcome of a specific, historically situated knowledge and technology. But scientific knowledge changed. And with years, scientists found out that microbes mingle and exchange genes and molecules more wildly than expected. Courtesy to Ele Eleonora Negro, who is uh, uh, a microbiologist, but as you see, also uh, an artist. So today, the metabolism of microbes, humans and animals, are entangled at an unprecedented industrial and human-induced scale. The meeting of our industrial history and scientific history has created a problem out of what in the past were solutions. Antibiotic resistance indeed has ecological ramifications. Antibiotic persisting in the environment do not disappear after being ingested. The tons of antibiotics consumed by humans and animals are released into soil and wastewater, and as a, co and as a consequence, Microbes today have different features, capacities and distribution than, than before industrialization and the discovery of penicillin. As Landecker says, the history of antibiotics is not behind us, it is in us. This is just an example, but I find it useful to make clear that human social historical events, so in this case, the discovery of penicillin, its industrial production, global medicalization, a certain understanding of microbial transmission, coupled with aspirations of control over nature, capitalism, and industrial mode of food production. So all these social processes materialize as biological events, processes, and ecologies. The example of antibiotic resistance emphasizes how microbes are important actors in making the social and the bios meet. The biology of history is also linked to the history of biology. That is how biology, as a discipline, changes and how this influences how people understand who we are as humans and how we relate with nature. The beauty of science is that it's not stat static, neither unique. There are different histories and approaches to be told and analyzed. And this is my work. This is my work as an anthropologist, an anthropologist of science and technology. So instead of going somewhere exotic, since 2014, I joined labs of scientists who study microbes. And I assure you that is exotic enough, right? <laughs> 
And when entering the lab for the first time, I had to learn their language. I had to learn how they see things, how they speak, and also how really how they see, you know, either through long strings of DNA or through a microscope. This work is, has been foundational for me to then lie the ground for the possibility of interdisciplinary collaboration. Anthropology can provide insights into what we have called bio biology of history, so the social political aspects that biologically constitute an ecosystem. Anthropologists also collaborate with microbiologists to design ethical, responsible and respectful approaches in sites of sampling and with different communities involved. And now, oh sorry, this was the antibiotic resistant cycle. I now coordinate a project funded by the European Research Council and in a smaller part also by the Italian Minister of Research based at the University of Venice, Ca' Foscari, and also based at this center called uh, Center for Environmental Humanities and in the part in where I stay, I stay uh, the part of philosophy and cultural heritage. The project that started September 2021 will end August 2026, so five years. The team is composed by six postdocs and myself. The project uh, comprises seven case studies across five continents, including China, Africa, Europe, US, the Pacific, and Antarctica. And this that you see here is the team. Uh, they all anthropologists, and we also have a social the theorist working with artists. So I now show you a, a very brief video that describe uh, the main topic and research question of the project has been developed for the broad uh, public. But I thought to show you also because to, yesterday we had this meeting about telling science stories, so... Audio. The audio is not there. No. Something is not working. Yes. No. Microbes are tiny living things that are found within, on and around us and are too small to be seen by the naked eye. The most common types are bacteria, viruses and fungi. The human body is home to millions of these microbes but they also live in animals, plants, water, soil and in the air. Microbes are everywhere. Microbes are the connectors between us and the environment in which we live. Health is a concept usually associated with humans, but how can we rethink human health as part of an interconnected environment? Health X Cross will explore the implications of approaching the planet as a body and the body as a planet. We are a team of anthropologists exploring laboratories where scientists analyze microbial data collected all around the world, derived from different samples crossing space, time and species. This huge amount of data is then aggregated into a supercomputer in order to develop scenarios of health for both us humans and the environment. 
anthropologists and scientists will collaborate to understand what it means to be human and to live on an interdependent planet. So this is more or less the project. We are in labs that have a variety of methodological appro approaches, scientific and social political imagination, gender composition. And this lab spans from labs driven by informaticians who develop platforms of digital data at a planetary scale, to labs focused on single microbes or to other labs with a commitment with the local community and local biodiversity led by indigenous scientists. What unites all these labs is that they study the microbiome across the human and the environment. This interface not only opens new ways to understand our relationship with nature and our essence as humans and our role in the universe, but also addresses future health solutions. Medicine has always taken inspiration from nature to identify drugs and Antibiotics is an example, but with technology, the technology we have now, and Margaret will tell you more about that, the traffic between the human and the environment is done at the scale and depth that was not imaginable before. For example, one of our case study is the lab that is using data of microbes coming from very different environmental sample, and then the, these are aggregate with other data to advance personalized medicine. But I want to push mine and your sociological imagination even further, that health is a social issue is an old truth. But the study of microbes brings new evidence to the fact that our health is relational, interdependent to what is outside us. This means that to stay healthy, we need to care for the health of other humans and non-humans as plants, animals, rocks, etc. How the health governance of the future looks like from this perspective? and which will be the overlaps, intersection, and differences with social justice and environmental governance. As an anthropologist, I'm very curious to explore how the microbe revolution is transforming the same concept of health, not only in popular media discourse, but really what can be the application of this science on our everyday life of this enlarged understanding of health as a more than human thing. There are three clusters that constitute the project's theoretical framework and our research questions. These clusters are more or less common to all case studies, even if each case study have a spe special affinity to one cluster than the other. These are one is called, the first one is called diversity, so how scientists remake notions of biological diversity that crosses conventional categorizations of space, time, species, by connecting the human and the environment. So these research classes address uh, the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being, that is ontology. Uh, this is important because the thing we do every day depend also on how we think about who we are. The second cluster is called space time of innovation. So many of the labs collaborate also with the so-called Global South to have data. And so we look at this kind of relationship. So we look at data governance, politics of research, ethical protocol, etc. And the last cluster is called health. So we look at how this kind of research shapes new trends in healthcare and health governance in terms of therapies, services, solutions, but also, as we said before, policies. This is the project where a consideration of the history of biology, so how knowledge and technologies change and how they are linked to social political assumption, is coupled with the biology of history, so how this impacts 
on biological data, biological samples, and their analysis in biological terms, and in general to our health. Along the lifetime of this project, and even before in, the, in, in some cases, Margaret, Diane, and Victoria, the next speakers of this panel, have been, for me, precious interlocutors. Three wonderful women and ex exceptional scientists who will be able to give you a taste of how exciting is the study of microbes. Surely you will be able to identify their different approaches across their commonalities. All of them have original intellectual paths, making them able to identify novel analytical synthesis beyond the boundaries of the state of art of their discipline. Margaret, a pioneer in the study of symbiosis, is now putting her energies in forging what the study of biology will look like in the future through microbes and across scales and across disciplines. Victoria has developed cutting-edge techniques to study microbial communities at the bottom of the ocean, and she explores how these relate to climate change. Diane is developing new methods and knowledge about a specific microbes that may make many things, uh, and crosses the human and the geological scale, rocks and human lungs. In the title, of my presentation, I ask whether we have, we have ever been human. So if we consider what this new science of microbes is telling us, that most of our cells are microbial, the answer seems to be no. We have never been humans, even, we, if, even if we, we thought so for a long time. At the same time, however, microbiome science, variety of approaches, their heterogeneous agendas, and the unbreakable entanglement between the social and the bios make very clear that we still are very human despite being composed from many microbes. And this makes science a very exciting and important environment and the endeavor for all of us. Thank you very much. Wait, 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 wait. You might, there might be some questions. Oh, good. <laughs> I thought at the end. Yes. Yes. And, and if you can say... Say your name. Say your name, please. Yes. Yeah. David Donahoe, Palo Alto. Um, now? Yes. Thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the global point of view, and I think uh, one... One comment that uh, my wife and I discussed is because of industrialization of diets, there's no bioequivalence between the grains and oils that people have when they live in different continents. And that must have an impact on the microbiome, actually a rather large one. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I'd love to hear uh, if you've had thoughts about that or will investigate it. Sorry, the quality, the nutrient quality of the same uh, food in different countries, or it, it appears to be the same, but because of industrialization of the diet, there's no bioequivalence. Yes. Yes, that that that's true, and this adds a further layer to the complexity of studying the microbiome because the microbiome changes hour by hour. It changes is much influenced by our lifestyle, from the biological properties of where we are. And even those studies that want to compare the same food in different places then have this other layer of complexity. That is true. And, and that's why I, I think that it's important to also have this other perspective that is more a sociological perspective on how our environment is changing and how we can integrate, consider these changes in our uh, research design. Yes, thank you. I think at this point, given the time, uh, thank Good. you very much, Roberta. Thank you very much.
Our next speaker is Dr. Margaret McCall Knox.